Hello guys! Welcome back to Rajas Mecha! It's Marco here, and today we translate the advanced theory we talked about a few weeks ago into advanced practice. A big canvas, simple free-flowing shapes, a deliberate lack of non-meaningful details or pre-made textures, and all the freedom of a subject not bound to an existing background, and all its visual expectations. If you are approaching miniature painting with conscious artistic intents, you cannot ask anything better than a bust. With this model I want to tell a story, a full story condensed in a single cinematic shot. Actually, multiple tales in a single frame. This is the story of the Martian and his struggle to survive with old, limited equipment, of the Nostromo's men exploring Acheron, of the Rocinante's crew, and, to be honest, of every astronaut crazy enough to put on an helmet with inside blinding LEDs. Impractical, sure, but super theatrical and dramatic. And they all are in the mood board I've created to support my vision with solid reference material. Every type of paint, every path of the airbrush, every technique, every dirty trick, and every single brushstroke, everything is there, or not there, to satisfy the needs of the story. This video perfectly stands on its own legs, but everything you'll see me do is a direct consequence of this video up here. So, if you want a full overview of my process, with a deep dive both in the mental, purely conceptual part of the work, and the more grounded, practical side of painting, consider them like a single entity. Don't forget to drop a like to help the diffusion of this video and the channel, and of course subscribe to join my painting journey in every corner of the hobby. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page, where you can find articles, extra material, and the real-time footage of my videos, with every single little line and brushstroke. Thanks a million, guys! The relative positions of model and plinth are always a key factor to create an engaging cinematic scene. Their internal relation defines the larger relation between a viewer and model, setting the main frame from which the story will be delivered. One of the main advantages of a square plinth is precisely to control and fix your stronger angles, aligning them with the four flat sides, that are the statistically most common way in which people will move around your creation. I tend to spend quite a lot of time studying all the possible different angles and how they could change or adapt to my mental picture, but in this case the sculpt is clearly telling me what it wants. Everything points to a strong frontal vision, perpendicular to the viewer, and I embrace these features from the very beginning, building up every new step on top of the idea that this guy is looking directly at you. As the imaginary director of photography of this short movie made of a single frame, I adjust and set my lights to make this view more interesting, and your relation with it more compelling. In almost every video I add a hint of how important the value sketch has become for my process, but working on an illustrational project like this one, completely story driven, and without the limitations imposed by the need for dynamism of uh, gaming models, you can really see and understand its crazy impact. The general structure, the internal positioning, the intensity and diffusion of my lights are locked in place as the first step and you'll be able to clearly see this framework in every stage of the work. And even in the final pictures, this topography and all its information are still there, completely unchanged. The idea is to have a top zenithal light coming from a cold, relatively diffused and weak artificial source, something like a flickering neon bulb inside the corridor of an old greasy spaceship and the secondary warmer light coming from a frontal lower angle from a screen or some kind of control panel. But to better focus the attention on the face without using too many confusing colors, I'm going to repeat this same relation inside the helmet, but with higher values and more powerful tones, setting a cinematic warm light coming from the lower part of the face shield, opposed to the highest values of the main zenithal light on the skull cap and the forehead. 
You can see how the lower part of this light setting is wider and stronger, to mimic the position and intensity of the imaginary arc of LEDs inside the mask, while the top is narrow and focused, with strong shadows on the sides, because it's coming from the cold light on top of the scene, and it's blocked on its margins by the opaque sides of the helmet, and the natural shape of the head. Oh, and just to be super honest and clear, this is not a one-way process, but if there is something that doesn't work, or could work better, I go back and fix it, using black ink to re-establish and remodel the shadows. On the face, I don't have a strong terminator between the two lights, because ideally one is stronger than the other, and their separation happening around the eyebrows and the top of the nose will be relatively weak, and as consequence mostly made out of colors. But on the spacesuit and its larger volumes, these values are almost the same, and stretched over bigger, more angular shapes. So there is a clear bridge of almost black shadows framing the two colliding reflections coming from the two light sources. These lights are at the same time a mix of visual sci-fi tropes and a super effective illustrational dramatic way to enhance volumes and the sense of the third dimension. That uh, with the circular reasoning, uh, that's why they became uh, visual sci-fi icons. I start the work on colors, with few translucent paints on the palette, and a pool of medium to push the transparency even further. The balance of opacity and tones is quite delicate here, so this time I prefer to skip the airbrush and move directly to the brush. Ironically, I would have used the airbrush on a small gaming miniature to obtain the same effect. This is interesting because uh, technically I'm setting the base tones, but on the face the external lights are so powerful and important in the story to become something like mid-tones, more than the skin tone itself. On the armor the work is a bit more straightforward, because the local colors are less drastically altered by the environmental light. Nonetheless, I don't lose a second building solid opaque base tones, because as always they don't have a lot of meaning, or any real practical use, more than setting the basic blocks of the scheme and their position and extension on the model. I don't care about flat tones, and even in uh, this rough initial stage, all my attention and care are invested in modulating the colors. It's subtle, but when pointed out, you can clearly see how different the orange elements are, depending on their relative position and their relationship with the lights. The shoulder pads are more vibrant and saturated, the round neck element is deeper and darker, and the skull cap is colder and desaturated, fading into the high blue tone of the zenithal light. This is the same color, coming from the same pot, but uh, different dilutions, and their consequent different opacities over the sketch, and a tone of complexity from the very first brushstrokes. With the basic scheme in place, I move to oil paint for an interesting trick. The selection of tones is kind of self-explanatory. 
I have a warm off-white color that plays the role of the local tone of the spacesuit and the simplified full spectrum of my two clashing lights. At the bottom I have a bright saturated yellow that fades into orange sensations and at the top a light blue that becomes deeper and darker in the second tube and the two blocks meet in the middle in their natural mixing into green tones. The practical use I make of these tones is a bit less intuitive and a bit more advanced. The paint on the palette comes straight from the tubes and it's completely undiluted. I take microscopic quantities with the tip of the brush and I apply microscopic dots on the model, positioning the tones in their natural place in the progression between the two main lights. These tubes don't have a lot of staining power and I chose them precisely to get a softer result, but still the acrylic layer underneath is like a sponge, able to catch and retain a lot of new fine pigments, so I work in small sections at a time to have a finer and better control over the process. Then with a large flat brush, only slightly dampened in uh, white spirit, I blend all these tones together following the shapes of the sculpt, moving the brush up and down on the vertical axis. This technique comes from tank and military modeling and it's used to break the smooth uniform tones of large flat surfaces with a ton of subtle internal movement. It could be considered as a light external layer of environmental effects and weathering, or the natural random discoloration of the material, or its coat of paint, coming from light, heat, handling, or simple senescence and inherent deterioration. And if you check almost anything coming out from a factory, you can see this kind of inconsistencies and internal variations on their surface. Usually this effect is applied using base tones and their most obvious lights and shadows, simply applying lighter or darker versions of the local color used in the previous layers, but here I push the concept a bit further. If I can do it with a simple generic light dark modulation, why can't I do it using bolder and more interesting lights? Clearly there is no reason not to. For the back of the model I add to the palette violet and purple to create a bit of extra internal contrast of temperature inside the elements not exposed directly to the yellow light coming from the front, basically setting the warm shadow of the cold main light to add contrast and extra visual interest in the secondary views. And here is the result of this unusual step. I quickly get a ton of interesting tones all over the armor and a complex modulation, both based on the colors of my light and the values of the sketch, because of the natural transparency of these paints. As a bonus, this layer is not uh, smooth and boring like something uh, made with the airbrush, or a more classic application of oil paints with their perfect silky blends but it's full of natural, random information, cool little artifacts, subtle streaks, and realistic discolorations. The only real downside of this step is that it makes you lose a massive amount of definition. But the bright sides of the situation are that I didn't really have anything to lose in my starting point and that uh, working with oils, establishing uh, precise geometric shadows and dark lines is really, really, really easy. Here I choose uh, black, burnt amber and two temperatures of uh, paints grey to create uh, dense fluid mixes that I use uh, to pinwash uh, crevices, details and every line, dent and cut of the sculpt. I let the paint flow into the shapes by itself with the help of the low surface tension of the solvent.
and I gently adjust and clean the imperfections using only the brush and a tiny bit of uh, white spirit for a more organic and uh, less precise look than the one obtained uh, with sponges and q-tips. I'm painting a mix of shadows and weathering at the same time, and the extra pigments left around, or the extra movement in the previous layer, can only add uh, more interesting stuff to look at. For these uh, two steps, I've used a serious amount of oil paint, so I leave the model to rest overnight before going back to acrylics. Before moving to the wet palette and the proper brushwork, I boost a bit the saturation of my main lights with a soft, translucent, sprayed layer of acrylic ink. The oils were heavily mixed together, and I layered the dark shadows on top, so I got for sure a lot of tones, but without any meaningful saturation, so I need to re-establish its presence before moving to the higher lights. Transparent turquoise ink from above, and bright, translucent yellow from below. Just a couple of uh, quick puffs to boost the extreme external vibrancy. And finally, the wet palette. I use the crazy saturation of Chimera colors to paint anything directly related to the lights, and scale 75 artist for all the rest, with tones mainly coming from the pastel and the black and white set, plus a few basic colors for the skin. Again, the selection of views is uh, quite contained and extremely simple to understand as a natural consequence of all the choices made so far. The most uh, notable thing here is the absence of a true, pure green tone. I want green to organically appear on the model as a result of the main lights crossing into each other, so to mimic the light's behavior in the most uh, realistic way possible. The green will appear from the optical and physical mix of the main blue and yellow tones. This way I get the right natural amount of desaturation and a more correct influence from the other tones, without using the local native vibrancy of a pure green color. Usually at this point we are used to paint uh, starting from the, let's call them, new mid-tones, building our way up to higher and higher lights. But in this particular case, my lights are like an halo all around the model. To avoid messing with the progression and disproportions, I start working from the lights, moving inwards, so I can easily fix high tones and values in the right precise extreme spots, and then adapt everything else to their fading from the source. To remain coherent to this approach and its wave of consequences, I start working on margins and edges, even on the elements not directly inside the main lights, and I adapt the native colors to the source of light that they are facing. Here for example I mix orange with a desaturated light blue to produce the believable version of an edge reflection bouncing from where these two colors meet. The lower parts of these uh, same elements get a similar treatment, but with all the reasoning and mixing moved into the yellow spectrum. Painting the face, I start fixing the solid anchor of the eyes. 
Because of the complex light setting, I feel that all the usual reference points I use to set up a face are in totally different places, so I set my solid ground around the eyes, expanding my adjustments from there. This way I can also work keeping a certain powerful focus on the area, to push on the idea that you are looking directly at each other. For a full, hyper-detailed step-by-step -step on how to paint realistic eyes of any size, check the video up here. My grubby toddler found a wet palette, <laughs> but don't worry, I've set it up precisely like the previous one, adding also a bit of magenta and violet to introduce a bit of extra life, with the sensation of blood running under the skin, in the details exposed less directly to the artificial lights. The overlapping of tones in the other parts of the model is uh, quite simple, but here the red sensation of the skin makes things a bit more complicated, and these uh, new tones fill the gap between the yellow, orange, red block and blue. This also works as an interesting colored mid-value terminator between uh, the two lights. Every wrinkle is a small, rounded edge, both inside the blue and the powerful uh, yellow light. I'm still far from the final highest values, but in this case I'm not working on hard geometric edges, and I must maintain a slower and more delicate pace. Nonetheless, you can see the definition increasing little by little. With this solid uh, framing of the light in place, I can start painting inside the shapes, but uh, since I don't want to take any chance at this point, I calibrate my mixes and my end, working first on the secondary views. I increase the transparency of my paint to glazing levels, but instead of using the classic mopping movement of the brush, I switch to a not so fine dotting. The idea is to add tones, but building uh, new textures and movement, on top of all the movement of the oil stage. And as soon as I feel more confident about my brushstrokes, I move the idea to the more visible parts. I can also use a thicker and more opaque paint, because the texture is in full focus here, so any little movement should be sharper and easier to read. Plus, again, I feel much more confident now. <laughs>
And of course, every time I push on an internal light, I feel the need to rebalance the impact of edges and main uh, tangent points to maintain their progressive relation. The edge itself has already the highest value from the initial framing, but I can always enhance its impact by making the line and the diffusion a bit larger, and I can increase the luminosity using more dense and more opaque paint. The remaining work is all about controlling better and increasing the final micro definition. It's not only my postmodern horror vacui that forces me to add new details, but like in an illustration or a movie shot, this is my way to control immersion and suspension of disbelief. The density of uh, painted elements and brush strokes in the core of the bust simulate the enhanced focus of your eyes in their central field of vision, and this makes the experience of uh, looking at uh, this little block of resin a bit more like uh, looking at a real person at uh, close range, deepening engagement and realism. And uh, since I had fun adding a ton of subtle details everywhere, I must uh, double down on the main areas. <laughs> And here is the final result. As I often do for this kind of models, I'll probably come back in a couple of weeks to add a little free hand or a cool easter egg somewhere on the armor, but that is stuff that requires me to be a bit more cool headed and kind of detached from the main paint job, but it's rare that I touch anything else. A lot of you ask me how to know when to stop, and this is probably the most terrifying question for any artist. I still don't have a proper answer, but working on projects where I don't have a quality or a time limit, I've learned to trust my instinct and ask the model if it's ready or not to go to the shelf. It always starts like a feeling in the back of the brain. The warning comes when a brushstroke seems kind of out of place or a bit redundant, and the final notice is when it starts looking wrong, or literally something that now I have to fix. It doesn't matter if it's just a microscopic dot of paint. That's a finished model. <laughs> if you like this video, give it a like and subscribe. Remember that you can ask me anything down below with a comment and you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page and join the community or maybe ask for a commission. See you next week, guys.